Thank you so much, Leila. Uh, I want to explain why there are two books. It's a, a little bit of an embarrassment of riches. I don't recommend it for authors. It had to do with the pandemic and the lockdown. So we'll suffice it to say. Two different publishers, too. But I wanted to uh, start out with the, uh, the Lost Arlington County. Uh, it's got a little more of a theme than my previous two books. Uh, it has a lot of my columns in it, but I also wrote uh, 15 or 20 uh, new entries uh, that have to do with things that used to be in Arlington but are no longer. That's the thing. There's, there's a, almost 100 illustrations, too. And uh, the theme of the book has a little more to do with historic preservation and some of the modern uh, challenges of uh, the uh, demand for new housing and the desire to protect uh, green space and uh, trees, uh, which is clashing with uh, the desire among people to save uh, examples of familiar architecture as well as uh, historic houses too. So I go into a lot of that detail. I talk about uh, race relations, uh, and I talk about the, the history of that, and I talk about the, what I have called the deconfederization of Arlington, where the, such as the removal of Robert E. Lee's name from uh, Washington Lee High School. So um, th this is a, a lot more affordable book, too, than the Custis one, <laughs> which I'll be honest about that. <laughs> Yes, I'll get into some of that, too. Thanks. Well, the Lost Arlington County is, uh, I'm not selling them here today, but I do have some little brochures in the back if you want to grab one. Uh, it's, that's a reasonable $22, yeah. And the Custis one is uh, double that, and it's, it's a, an academic press, and that's why it's a different uh, arrangement here. You can, get, you can get it at the Arlington Historical Society at a discount, too, I'll say that. So uh, Custis, uh, he, he is sort of the closest we come in Arlington to having a, a founder, a single founder of Arlington County. 
he lived quite a remarkable life. Uh, he knew the first 15 presidents. He went to every inauguration except the very first one when he was only three years old. And uh, l l less known that uh, his life is 1781 to 1857, and it makes a nice bridge between the American Revolution and the Civil War in terms of America's history and development. Uh, but he is lesser known than Robert E. Lee. Uh, Robert E. Lee was his son-in-law, and uh, Lee took over uh, with his wife uh, the Arlington House mansion uh, after Custis dies in 1857, and he sort of overshadowed Custis uh, in the history books. And uh, I had noticed this. Uh, I would noticed that there was no biography of Custis. There's biographies of his sister, Nellie Custis, who both of whom were raised at Mount Vernon by George and Martha Washington. So uh, that was my opening, and I also saw that the literature that does exist on Custis really needed a modernization, uh, of, particularly of the uh, treatment of the issue of slavery. And at the same time, you know, Arlington House, uh, since 2017, was undergoing a, a big renovation, uh, thanks to a Arlington House Foundation donation from the philanthropist uh, David Rubenstein, and they uh, completely revamped their presentation of slavery to include much more on the enslaved person's community. Uh, they, Lee is still there. If you've been to it recently, if you haven't, I would recommend it. I've been a couple times in the last six months since it reopened. It got delayed by the pandemic too, but they have a, a very thought-provoking new exhibit, which uh, some of the details you'll hear about today. So uh, Custis is best known, of course, for, our, for Arlington House, but he was famously raised uh, at Mount Vernon. So I'll go into some of the details on that. Um, here are his parents. This is uh, John Park Custis, uh, who was the son of my Custis's grandfather, uh, Daniel Park Custis, and his first wife, who was Martha Dandridge, who we know as Martha Washington. So Daniel Park Custis dies uh, in, uh, let's see, it's 1757. And the widow, uh, Martha Custis, is very wealthy. And uh, she owns plantations down off, in the, off the Pamunkey River and is a very eligible widow there in New, New Kent County. So that's how George Washington came to marry her. Uh, and then uh, Custis's mother is Eleanor Calvert. She was a descendant of Lord Baltimore from Maryland. And uh, Jackie and her marry in the, the mid-1700s. Uh, after he's raised at Mount Vernon, and they produce four children, uh, Eliza Park Custis, Martha Park Custis, Eleanor Park Custis, who's Nellie, and George Washington Park Custis. They all have that Park middle name because for legal reasons it entitles them to an inheritance. Complicated story. So um, Custis, uh, Jackie Custis dies right after the Battle of Yorktown, 1781. He was an aide-de-camp for George Washington, and he uh, uh, leaves uh, the four children orphaned, and George Washington Park Custis is only six months old, and that's when Martha and George Washington decide to adopt the two youngest ones and raise them out at Mount Vernon. Custis was born here at the Mount Airy Mansion, which is in Prince George's County, uh, Upper Marlboro. I had to sneak onto the site during the pandemic get this photograph, but uh, they hold weddings and things there. It's, it's, uh, and that's also where uh, Custis's parents were married. Um, so he was raised at Mount Vernon in a life of privilege. And so his portrait was done uh, several times by uh, renowned portrait artists. And uh, he's made to look a little bit like a, a god in some of these pictures. Uh, the famous picture of, by Edward Savage, the portrait of the first family, uh, you can see Washi, as he was called when he was a young boy. You can see him with his hand on the globe, and I like to interpret that as a, uh, a sign that there were high hopes for him when he was uh, growing up. And this, this uh, paint uh, as an engraving was circulated around the country in the 1790s, so that's when George Washington Park Custis would have become a household name. So he was uh, tutored at Mount Vernon, and this is a shot I have of the North Garden House. It has a sign on it, which is, tells you that Custis was tutored there. He had a succession of tutors, 
even Washington's personal secretary, Tobias Lear, was, was one of them. Uh, but here's the thing, Custis was a terrible student. And he, uh, he started out at a kind of a prep school in Philadelphia that became the university, part of the University of Pennsylvania. And he went on to the College of New Jersey, which became Princeton. He was actually uh, kicked out of there. And he then went to St. John's in Annapolis, which of course is still there, the great books curriculum. And so there's a famous exchange of correspondence between the student, the errant student and George Washington in the 1790s, where Washington is imploring him about the importance of buckling down and studying and Custis is buttering his benefactor up and, and you know, defending himself and giving some details on his classics that he's reading. But he basically was easily distracted pro probably by, by women. And this famous quote, um, from Washington talks about his uh, inconquerable disposition to indolence. And in my treatment of this, I try to uh, put together the most comprehensive version of this famous correspondence between George Washington and George Washington Park Custis, bringing in the two uh, college headmasters at both Princeton and St. John's, as well as Custis's stepfather, David Stewart, and uh, Tobias Lear, the tutor, uh, uh, and, all agonizing over how to deal with this uh, poor, poor performer. <laughs> so he finally uh, heads back to Mount Vernon uh, without his degree, and uh, uh, he knows that he's going to inherit a wealthy estate. And uh, this is important to make perhaps his motivation. So, uh, you know, to to, to be well born in the United States, you know, would have cut two ways. You, 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 he had a famous name, so it, it obviously it opened doors and it assigned him for the rest of his life to answer to questions about George Washington. But there were other children or stepchildren, or grandchildren of our founding fathers who didn't fare well. Uh, a good example is uh, John Payne Todd, who was this, this adopted son of President James Madison, who kind of squandered his life in uh, uh, alcoholism and gambling. Uh, and then uh, by, by contrast, you have, the, of course, the Adams family where the second son becomes uh, president himself and, and the rest of the family keeps uh, accomplishing things. So uh, Custis in uh, 1798, when there's a threat of a war with France, they assemble what was called the New Army and George Washington is called out of retirement to be the uh, commander in chief. And George Washington arranges for young Custis at age 18 to become a, a cornet uh, in this army. And he also went behind the scenes, even though he, he claimed he didn't want to do such things, pull strings, to get him uh, a fancier uniform and uh, equipment too. Um, so then George Washington dies December of 1799, and uh, in his will, Custis, who's an executor when he comes of age, he's not old enough yet, uh, is given uh, about 1,200 acres of land in what today is Arlington County. And then Martha Washington, she dies in May of 1802, and that's when Custis uh, inherits uh, a lot more wealth, uh, including 200 enslaved uh, persons, the, the Dowager slaves. Um, and so he, Custis then takes that uh, property that he inherited from his father, which is the Potomac side property, 1,100 acres, and builds a tribute to George Washington. He originally called it Mount Washington, but that ended up taken by somebody. So uh, he eventually changed it to Arlington House, and that's named for the Custis family ancestral plantation on the eastern shore of Maryland, which you can go visit. I've been there. It's a modern suburban home with a graveyard and plaque out, out in front of it where there's been some archaeology digs. Uh, now, Arlington House, he also, uh, it took him 18 years to build it. He used the famous British architect, George Hadfield, who had worked on the cap U.S. Capitol and the uh, City Hall in D.C. and some courthouses. And uh, it took uh, 16 years in stages, and in the meantime, Custis was living uh, with his enslaved and free workforce in uh, unprepossessing uh, quarters on the Potomac. 
and the relics that he had in, either inherited or purchased at auction uh, included uh, a lot of silver and china and Martha Washington's books and the bed in which Washington died and uh, paintings and all that had, uh, I guess they did their best to protect it. Uh, of course, Mount Vernon and Washington's library were inherited by Bushrod Washington, not, not by uh, Custis. Uh, and so when he, he built uh, Arlington House, when it was ready, he hosted a lot of elegant parties, uh, sheep shearing competitions with a lot of locals, including uh, John Mason, who lived on what today is Roosevelt Island. And um, the only thing missing was a marriage. So in uh, 1804, he is betrothed to Mary uh, Randolph Fitzhugh, who had grown up first in, uh, on Chatham Plantation in Fredericksburg from a, a wealthy planter's daughter, William Fitzhugh. Fitzhugh had also built uh, a, a mansion in which today is Fairfax called Ravensworth, which is out the site of it is at Braddock Road and the, the Beltway. And he built in Old Town Alexandria on Orinoco Street uh, a house that she lived in as a, as a daughter, uh, as a child, I should say. So um, she was of aristocratic royalty. And so I got the uh, marriage bond, which I got from the Library of Virginia. And I had to get permission both from the Library of Virginia and from Paul Ferguson, the Arlington County Clerk of the Court, to, to publish this in the book. <laughs> They're married July 6th, uh, 1804. So uh, Molly, as, as, as we'll call her, to differentiate her from her later daughter, Mary. Uh, they're both named Mary. But Molly brings with her to the marriage uh, a, a, a close acquaintance with William Meade, who was her cousin. And he went on to become the Bishop of Virginia. They still have a room named for him at the Virginia Theological Sem uh, Sem Seminary. And uh, he, ch he was at Arlington House reading uh, in Custis's library when he changed his mind about his career and decided to go to divinity school. And he went on to become a big reformer of the Anglican Church in uh, Virginia and the rest of the colonies. And he uh, would be active in the American Colonization Society, as was most of Custis's family. And I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. So let's talk about... Uh, here he is in 1808, uh, one of the many portraits. Uh, well, the, Custis's famous relatives were handsome and soft-spoken and duty-driven. Pardon me, if you think about Washington or, or Robert E. Lee. Custis was short, beak-nosed, verbose, paunchy, and playful. In other words, he was approachable, I would say. He did possess a mellifluous voice that in an age before microphones could enthrall hundreds in a room or a public square. And he did that on every Washington's birthday. But his speeches often grew tiresome to uh, Jeffersonians and uh, other critics, uh, <clears throat> political uh, uh, competitors. Uh, and he did do political endorsements, uh, particularly like military heroes like uh, Andrew Jackson and Zachary Taylor for president. He weighed in as an essayist and an orator on the top tier issues of the day, including uh, domestic economic independence, uh, farming innovation, the collapse of his beloved Federalist Party, the advent of the steamship and the railroad, the protection of the rights of Irish Catholic immigrants, and the first federal benefits for war veterans. That would be both the Revolutionary War and the, and the War of 1812. And at Arlington House, he greeted countless uh, uh, VIP uh, guests. So his daughter Mary, in her recollection, said, Mr. Custis was of medium height and well-formed, his complexion fair and somewhat florid, his eyes light and expressive of great kindliness of nature, his voice full, rich, and melodious, his deportment graceful and winning, his courtesy to strangers extremely cordial, and his affection for his friends warm and abiding. Now, though he opposed the uh, U.S. declaration of war uh, on England in 1812, he took up, uh, by 1814, when the Brits were actually here, he took up arms in Blamesburg and he accepted no pay. He also uh, made a lot of fair progress as a farming innovator. He, he had his own uh, breed of sheep called Arlington Improved, which he tried to 
market to compete with the more popular merino sheep. And he tried to boost domestic clothing manufacture. And if you go on the website of the modern day U.S. Agriculture Department, you'll see Custis's name listed as one of the prime agricultural innovators. But, uh, and then he also embarked on what would be uh, a lifetime of commemorations of, of George Washington. And uh, this is um, an 1830s uh, engraving of what Washington's birthplace, which uh, is the mansion was called Wakefield uh, down on the Potomac. Uh, and it's uh, today it's Pope's Creek, Pope with no apostrophe. And uh, it's run by the National Park Service. So this show, this is one of the earliest commemorations too in, in American history of uh, uh, sort of idolizing of George Washington. That, that's why that's important. Um, now he, you got to remember when he's building Arlington House that he has about sixty enslaved persons there, but the real profits to his fortune come from these two plantations down on the uh, Pamunkey River near Richmond, uh, east of Richmond. Uh, called Roman Coke and White House. And uh, <clears throat> they, uh, he had about 130 enslaved persons there, and he had a succession of overseers and managers. And those, uh, his correspondence with those managers is what I relied on for a lot of, a lot of my research. Um, this is an 1880s uh, engraving by a Civil War veteran of <clears throat> what Roman Coke looked like. Uh, <clears throat> It was originally called Roman Cock, but Robert E. Lee changed the name of it later when he inherited it for matters of taste, I guess. Now, here's um, a sample of the ledgers of <clears throat> the reports from the overseers from these two plantations. <clears throat> and it's upsetting to modern eyes because they take the livestock and the enslaved uh, population and, and put them together on the same ledger. And they have many descriptions and the uh, dealing, dealing with ages and with uh, health conditions. Um, we'll get more into the slavery issue in a little bit. Uh, then, very important, when, when the Marquis de Lafayette has his triumphant return to the United States in 1824 and 25, uh, he spends several days with uh, Custis, whom he knew as a boy uh, since 1784 when uh, Lafayette visited Mount Vernon. And uh, Custis hosts Lafayette for a, a, a evening dinner at Arlington House in October of 1824. And I, I have a letter, an, a, an unsigned letter that gives a very vivid description of that whole evening and the, sir, the, how the meals were served by the enslaved domestics and uh, uh, all the uh, important personalities from the War Department who were there that night and, and other members of the Custis family. It's never been published before, so I was pleased I opened the book with that. And then he and Lafayette engaged in a lot of debate about the morals of slavery, because uh, Lafayette was an abolitionist. And so uh, Custis, which this shows how he had recovered from his errant schoolboy days, because he became an excellent reporter, that he would spend the day with Lafayette. They went to Mount Vernon, they went to Fort McHenry, they went down to Yorktown, Fredericksburg, all this travel. And uh, Lafayette, he would talk, and then Custis would come home at night and, and write down notes. And then he proceeded to publish a series of essays called Conversations of Lafayette. It started out in the Alexandria Gazette and was taken over by the uh, National Intelligencer. And uh, that was how Custis got started on his recollections of uh, Washington, which we'll get, we'll get to later. So then uh, a key figure in his life is the editor, William Seton, who was editor of the National Intelligencer, who encouraged Custis, even though he didn't always agree with him politically, encouraged him to write his memoirs of life with the first president. And uh, Seton went on to become the publisher of the predecessor to the congressional record as a businessman, a printer. And he later became the mayor of the District of Columbia, which is quite a life, I think. OK, so then you get to um, uh, the next generation. So Custis, uh, his daughter Mary, she was born in 1808. And they, uh, Molly and George Washington Park Custis had, had four children, but three died in infancy. The one male, Edward, I think, lived uh, 18 months or so. 
So Mary Custis is the only surviving child for them. And she would have known Robert E. Lee when they were children because Robert E. Lee was living on Orinoco Street uh, where his father, Light Horse Harry Lee, had been renting from William Fitzhugh. Those are all the connections. And uh, uh, Mary Lee also had recalled in letters that she had seen the young Robert E. Lee during Lafayette's 1824 parade through Alexandria. She saw a teenage Lee all decked out in, in uniform. So they had, uh, well, let me show you the, this is the Orinoco Street house. By the way, it is on the market today, unless it's been sold in the last few days that I haven't checked. But um, this is where Custis and Molly were married. Uh, and uh, it's where Lee spent uh, ages, I think it's probably around three, three to 10 or 10 or so. Okay, so, uh, they have a, uh, a dramatic wedding in the parlor of Arlington House in June of uh, 1831. And uh, Lee's West Point classmates are his uh, groomsmen. And uh, a lot of the high society custises from across the river at Tudor Place and at uh, Woodlawn, which is where Nellie Custis lived, and Ravensworth, which is where the Stewarts settled, uh, Custis's uh, stepfather and his mother. Custis's mother, by the way, remarried in 1783 and proceeded to have uh, almost 20 more children. Now, most of those did not survive, of course, but it's uh, astonishing and there was uh, much gossip about that. Um, so Custis at first was a little reluctant for his daughter to marry a military man because he knew it would be a, uh, a life of uh, constant travel, but uh, he was eventually pers persuaded by it. Uh, here's, uh, Cuss has continued in his efforts to promote the legacy of Washington by arranging for the rescue of a decrepit and neglected grave for the mother of George Washington, Mary Ball Washington. Uh, she's originally born in Lancaster County, but she, she uh, ra raised, uh, you know, Washington was born at Pope's Creek and then she raised him at Ferry Farm, which is today just a suburb of Fredericksburg. And then when, she, when Washington was successful, he bought her a house in downtown Fredericksburg, which you can see today in, as a museum. But her grave is right in the historic district of Fredericksburg uh, near Kenmore Plantation. And the owner of Kenmore at the time, I was saying, Gordon is the one who paid for this monument. Custis helped arrange for President, his buddy, President Andrew Jackson, to take a steamboat down to uh, Fredericksburg to dedicate this monument to uh, Mary Ball Washington. And there were, I think it's 15,000 spectators. And if you wonder where the heck 15,000 spectators could fit in Fredericksburg, just go to the historic district and you'll see how much space there is. Uh, on that trip, uh, Custis uh, had his enslaved domestic named Philip Lee uh, transport the tent that George Washington used in many battles during the Revolutionary War. It's one of the uh, relics that Custis had purchased at auction. And uh, he used it uh, at special events for most of his life. Uh, and uh, there were several uh, components of it. And today you can see it in Philadelphia at the Museum of the American Revolution. And there's another part of it down at the Yorktown battlefield. Uh, Custis, uh, in 1845, he took an important uh, tour of New England and visited uh, the Bunker Hill battlefield in Lexington and Concord. He stopped in, in New York City and, and he was welcomed all, on all and was well covered by newspapers during that trip. And he, he wasn't happy with how the uh, uh, Bunker Hill uh, monument and battlefield was being preserved because it was being replaced by, sounds familiar to us, uh, housing. <laughs> Uh, to, to, to bring back the local angle, uh, Custis uh, built the mill, and it was a, a, he, uh, an, a primitive one in around 1808, which is today off Columbia Pike at South uh, Columbus Street. Uh, there's an uh, auto repair shop right in front of it. And uh, he revised it and expanded it in 1836, and uh, it was manned by both uh, free and enslaved labor. And this is an engraving done during the Civil War, but this is what it looked like uh, before it, it collapsed uh, after the Civil War. 
And uh, John Barcroft moved in and built an even bigger uh, mill there, which lasted until the uh, 1930s, I believe. So here's, here's some older portraits of Custis. Um, he's still um, uh, asked to be on commissions. Uh, he, he gave his advice on the building of the Washington Monument and he wasn't officially appointed to that commission. He offered Arlington House to be the site of what became the Washington Monument. And uh, he also, uh, by this time in the 1830s and 40s, he was in demand by biographers of George Washington, like uh, Jared Sparks and Washington Irving. They would come to his uh, to Arlington House to interview him and, and use him as a consultant. So did uh, famous painters, the sons of uh, Charles Wilson Peale. And uh, a lot of autograph seekers came through there too. Um, Custis was present at the corner, layings of the cornerstone of the Capitol as a boy in 1793 and as an adult when a new cornerstone for the expanded version was laid in 1851. So I sort of call, I call him sort of the zealot of the 19th century. Uh, he was welcomed in 1812 as a member of the brand new American Antiquarian Society, uh, but he was rejected by the Society of the Cincinnati. Uh, I don't know if you all know the criterion there, but the Society of Cincinnati, which is where my wife works today, it's, down there on Massachusetts Avenue in Anderson House. It's the officers of the Revolutionary War and their French counterparts. And so you have to, to be a member today, you have to prove that your ancestor was, uh, was one of those officers. He was rejected there. He, uh, he, nor did he join the Masons. And it's interesting that George Washington, uh, this is the topic of my column that's out uh, tomorrow, by the way, uh, on the Masons, that George Washington, there's a new book coming out on him. And, um, Custis uh, dealt with the Masons, gave them artifacts, but he never joined. And the speculation is that he wasn't considered honorable because of an arrest. And this is something that wasn't even discovered until the 1980s, where he was accused of stealing silver spoons from Gatsby's Tavern, which of course is still open there in Alexandria. And uh, he it was a no-show in court on that. And so it, it's not clear exactly how that was resolved. It was probably probably hushed up. So here's a, but here's what Custis does with his spare time. Uh, he 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 does have um, financial troubles. You got to remember that, and I'll get into that a little bit more with the uh, the slavery issue. But he took to uh, to play writing, and uh, in the 1830s and 40s, and he had several plays produced up and down the East Coast uh, in New York, Boston, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and at the new National Theater, which opened in Washington in 1836. A lot of the plays were heroics of George Washington, as this Indian prophecy was, as is a story of an Indian chief in, this, in 1770 who had predicted that George Washington, this uh, imposing man on horseback, would someday lead an empire. And uh, he wrote, he tried to write uh, something about more world, uh, worldwide interests of Scot Scotland in the 18th, uh, 14th century, and it was a big dud. So people wanted him to write more on patriotic America. Uh, at the same time, he also took to paintings. Uh, and if you visit Arlington House today, you can see uh, some of his paintings in, in the studio and where he worked. Uh, they were mostly battlefield scenes, and he would do it from his own interviewing and research of the uniforms and the uh, landscape and the uh, equipment that was from the actual battlefield. So they were respected as historical documentation. Uh, they were not really respected in terms of painting technique and talent. Uh, but this one, uh, you can, if you look closely in, uh, underneath the man with his arm extended, you can see a rendition of a uh, Molly Pitcher, who was the, the legendary uh, female uh, combatant uh, that is, if you go on the New Jersey Turnpike to the Molly Pitcher rest stop, you'll see a lot of versions of her, which I just did this summer. Now, this is a, a, another painting that uh, is attributed to Custis as an equestrian figure that he often uh, refers to. Um, now, he, Custis, uh, he, he was... He had his detractors, I should make that clear. He, he, uh, 
he was mocked as the inevitable after dinner speaker after decades. Maybe people had grown tired of some of his uh, idolatry for Washington. And he was one of the last uh, in the 19th century to appear in public in knee breeches and ruffled shirts. And he sang Revolutionary War era songs into the 1850s. You can see how he would have some detractors. And I call him a strange amalgamation of mediocrity and national greatness. But his, uh, his uh, colleague in the uh, American Colonization Society said this, he read much, his memory was quick and retentive, and his knowledge of history and the public affairs of the world was remarkably full and accurate. Uh, so this brings us to the really the most topical issue uh, that I deal with in my book, which, which is slavery. Now, I, I feel like I've done the most modernized and comprehensive account of this, but I, uh, I'm going to give you the big scoop of the book, but I don't want to claim that it's my scoop because it's been uh, written about by others, but it's, it's not, not quite been assembled in the way I did it. So this, this is a, uh, a, a set of laissez-passe documents that you would have printed up that the enslaved uh, people would have to get permission to leave the property and go into town on an errand. And uh, uh, interviews later with James Parks, one of those uh, enslaved men said that Custis was uh, uh, very uh, lenient about granting them and he would always give them extra money when they, when they needed to go to town. Um, uh, among the most uh, well-known enslaved persons from Arlington House, uh, we have uh, Selena Gray and Thornton Gray, and they were one of two <laughs> African-American couples who were married in the parlor of Arlington House, which is a rare privilege. And Selena Gray goes down in history as the one who has helped uh, rescue the Washington relics when the Civil War had broken out and the Union troops were uh, climbing the Arlington Heights Hill, and she uh, saved uh, a lot of those relics uh, for on behalf of Mrs. Lee. Um, to the left is uh, a drawing of Lawrence Parks, slave done by uh, the daughter, Mary, Mary Lee. And then James Parks is to the right. He's well known here in Arlington too, and his descendants are still around because he, he was born into slavery at Arlington House, but he stayed on after the Civil War and as an employee, and he worked for the cemetery all the way up until his death in 1929. It's pretty remarkable. And he was interviewed by uh, the Evening Star in 1928, and that gives us a lot of the detail about what happened at Arlington House. So the biggest, uh, most important slave uh, uh, family, uh, enslaved family at Arlington House would be the, the Syfaxes. And he, here's the gist of it. Uh, in 1803, a child was born uh, to Ariana Carter, an enslaved African-American at Arlington House. And the father, we think today, was George Washington Park Custis. So this would be a year before he's, his marriage to, uh, to Mary uh, Randolph uh, Fitzhugh. So um, the Syfaxes, uh, the, the clues that we have for this are that uh, the daughter was, was named Mariah Syfax, and she was, uh, in 1821, also allowed to marry in the parlor of Arlington House. This is even before Robert E. Lee uh, had his marriage there. And uh, her husband was Charles Syfax. In 1826, Mariah Syfax is freed and is given 17 acres of land from Custis's estate, which is right behind where Henderson Hall was, right near the... Sheraton Hotel today. And uh, this is quite unusual. The manumission was cemented uh, about 20 years later in 1845. It was done through the uh, Quaker apothecary uh, merchant named Edward Stabler, whose apothecary shop you can still visit in Old Town Alexandria, which I enjoyed doing. And they gave me a lot of good documents, uh, receipts from the Custises and Lees of Washington. But he... Um, it, Custis could sell to him knowing that he would in turn free the enslaved persons. And there's some delic delicacies about it. And then the final clue is that in the 1880s, an elderly Mar Mariah Syfax gave an interview to the uh, Kansas, uh, the Atchison, Kansas newspaper, in which she said that Custis had called her in one day and said that, I am your father, and uh, that uh, she 
was an equal to Mrs. Lee, and Mrs. Lee was very kind to her. That's what Mar Mariah Syfax said. So this story was mentioned in newspapers in the 19th century, and then it kind of hibernated, and nobody talked about it. It was never acknowledged by any Custis's or Lee descendants. But it shows up in the 1930s when an African-American historian addressed it in a federally published um, guidebook to Washington. And then by the 1980s and 90s, you could read about it in Smithsonian and the Washington Post. And uh, uh, nowadays, it's a big part of the exhibit in today's Arlington House. And if you go there, you'll see a lineage chart. The one I have in my book is more of a straightforward, keep the characters straight, here are their dates lineage chart, but the one at Arlington House in the exhibit on the enslaved community has a direct line between Mariah Syfax and her great-grandmother, Martha Washington. So we'll see how, whether that uh, takes hold. And then this is her grave. Uh, she's buried there with about six or seven other Syfax members. It's in Suitland, Maryland, called the Lincoln Cemetery. All right, so here we are, uh, we're getting uh, into, into the, their, their dotage years. Um, uh, he, Custis was, in this time, defending slavery, beginning in the 1820s, but on up into the, the 1840s, through the American Colonization Society. And I don't know how familiar you all are with it, but it was founded in uh, 1816. And uh, a lot of big names were in it, uh, James, President James Monroe and uh, John, Supreme Court Justice John Marshall and Bushrod Washington, the nephew of Washington, and the presidents of the major colleges in the country. It was pretty mainstream, in other words. And their mission was to uh, send blacks back to Africa by taking freed uh, blacks, trying to make them volunteer, and uh, funding their passage and setting them up in a new nation that became Liberia. And you'll notice the capital of Liberia is Monrovia for James, for James Monroe. And uh, William Lloyd Garrison, who was the big abolitionist editor, just was so appalled by this that he was very critical. I mean, he criticizes Custis by name. Custis, his allies were his uh, brother-in-law, William Fitzhugh, and uh, Bishop Mead and uh, a lot of other mainstream people. Custis shows up in the debates, uh, the, uh, the annual meetings of the American Colonization Society, and he has sort of a pseudo-scientific rationale for why blacks are not naturally not suited to the North American climate and all that. So you can, I try to give you some more detail on that. Um, so in his, um, his, in the 1850s, his, he starts to lose his relatives. His, 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 sis, his sisters die. His wife, Molly, dies in 1853. And then uh, Custis dies in October of 1857. And uh, he's, um, uh, his service was attended by thousands on Arlington House. Lots of military units came over the river. And it's, 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 it's too bad he was invited by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, which was a brand new first preservation society in the country, and the first certainly organization really run by women, they had invited him to attend their inaug uh, inaugural uh, sort of ribbon cutting, we would call it, of uh, Mount Vernon under new ownership restored, it was to happen in 1858, but Custis was, it was not to be for him. So uh, he's buried uh, at Arlington House behind uh, the, uh, what today is the administration building. That's his wife's uh, tomb to the right of the tree, and that oak tree has been there for 150 years, and it is uh, damaging the grave. So we're thinking about trying to do something about that. So meanwhile, Custis has been working all these years on his memoirs, uh, and uh, the editor, Benson Lossing, was uh, who he had met in 1853 when he came and did a whole Harper's profile of Arlington House, has been working with him. And he knew Custis was aging and getting ill, and he was trying to, you know, uh, cajole him into getting back, getting his pen to paper and not lose this opportunity. And uh, Lossing was, uh, had done a, uh, excellent uh, sketches of objects and descriptions of uh, things at Mount Vernon, and he had also visited the Revolutionary War battlefields and done a whole book on that. So he teamed up with uh, the daughter, uh, Mary Custis Lee, and they edited this volume uh, called Recollections and Private Memoirs of Washington. 
And it is a, uh, a six or 700 page tome. It's got a lot of undigested profiles. And uh, it, <clears throat> it does have those famous letters, some of them, between Washington and Custis about his poor study habits. And uh, it has some good intimate details of what Washington was like. And I'll give you one example. Uh, the um, Custis was asked uh, which portraits uh, captured George Washington the best. And, and he said, Trumbull for the figure, Stuart the head, and Sharples the expression. And those are the three there that you, you want to delve into that. Uh, and in Custis's will, this is where he plants kind of a time bomb. And I'm, I'm nearing the end here, and then we have, we'll have a few minutes for questions. Uh, in Custis's will, which he wrote in 1753, and I reprint it in the book, he uh, says that his enslaved persons should be freed within five years. And Robert E. Lee is named as the executor, although the daughter, Mary, is technically the owner of Arlington House after uh, he dies. And uh, the problem is that he also promises $10,000 to each of his seven grandchildren, the, the Lee children. And uh, Lee uh, realizes that he can't afford any of this. So uh, he, he anguishes over it for five years. And this, meanwhile, the enslaved persons had been told, or they said, and this was written up in the papers at the time, that they were promised their freedom much earlier than five years. That They said Custis had personally told them that. Lee didn't believe that. So Lee finally ends up freeing them uh, by name in December of 1862, right after the Battle of Fredericksburg. So that was uh, kind of unsatisfactory to all. Uh, I also talk a lot about uh, their treatment of the slaves, how, how they did teach them to read Molly and her daughter Mary, uh, in some ways violated state law by teaching them to read mostly the Bible. Uh, and Custis was teased them about how it was, it was really illegal. But they, and they had a very religious justification for their views on slavery that comes across loud and clear. All right, and then um, if you want to go visit Custis properties, as I did, uh, this is what you would find at the sites of the White House and Roman Coke today. They're on the opposite sides of the Monkey River, uh, two different counties. And uh, I also enjoyed uh, stopping in St. Peter's Episcopal Church there in New Kent County, which is where all the Custises in that area worship. This is a 300-year-old church, and the, the rector there is buried. He's the one who married George and Martha Washington uh, at, the, at nearby Arlington House. Uh, and I just thought, wanted to uh, read one quote about, you know, Custis, he really didn't handle the slavery issue with much vision. Uh, or uh, progressiveness, uh, but I would say that his his life was really overshadowed by where his heart lay, and the, the, the central theme was uh, a perpetuation of the fame and memory of George Washington as a sun that never sets. And here's his uh, love of country quote that I'll end with. Custis wrote uh, to the Jamestown Society in the 1850s, if in the wildest days the wildest man that ever was born of woman had been told that the United States of America in the short period of some three score years would become one of the leading powers of the world and would be in a short time the mistress of the world, he would have pronounced the prophecy an idle dream. So that's what I have. Thanks. <laughs> So uh, we have about 10 minutes. Does anybody want to ask questions? Or... Yes? I attended a lecture at Marymount University about a month ago given by a psychiatrist. Yes. I can't remember his name. Steve Hammond. Yes. He never discussed Maria Selkirk in his lecture. Now maybe? Well, he knows all about her. In fact, he, this picture I took of the Syfax grave out in Suitland, Maryland, he and I took that together. So, so he, he knows all about it. I'm trying to remember, you know, that night, it's the Arlington Historical Society lecture with the Syfax family historian. Uh, the, he's a descendant. We, we talked a lot about what happens to the Syfaxes after the Civil War and, and what careers they had and the family in Arlington. That's really was the focus of his lecture. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the laws were toughened after 1831, which is Nat Turner's Rebellion, which was also in Virginia. So uh, they're all free by the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862 and in 1860 in the District of Columbia, a little earlier. So I'm not conversant enough to, to fill you in on when it might have changed in Virginia about the idea that they had to leave. I know that requirement was bandied about. Uh, I, I read a lot of that. Um, you know, it's interesting about, I mentioned Nat Turner's Rebellion. Nellie Custis was very uh, upset with uh, William Lloyd Garrison's uh, and the, the defense of uh, Nat Turner, and she wrote a really racist, scathing letter about attacking William Lloyd Garrison, saying he was a, a threat to her whole way of life and everything. And I published part of that letter. So she was much more of a hardliner on slavery than her brother. Yes, Sandy. Yeah, so uh, for 10 years I've been writing The Our Man in Arlington, which is in the Falls Church News Press, which is a weekly, and it's online as well as uh, hard copies. And I try and do history about every other week, but I do a lot of current stuff, and it's a, it's a nonpartisan column. I try and make it entertaining and uh, deal with community life. Uh, it's not, I don't endorse candidates or anything, I'll put it that way. So. And I, you know, I, if you give me your email, I can put you on a distribution list. Sometimes it's entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions from the uh, people at home? <laughs> can you, are they able to do that? Uh, yeah. If people want to write them in, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put that here. Can you give us some examples of walks in Arlington? Like, what's walks? Sure. So let's take, let's switch to the other book. Is that all right? We got a few minutes here. Well, I was able to get on the back cover the old Putt Putt Golf and the Parkington, uh, which a lot of us who lived here in the 60s remember. Well, it's very popular on the Facebook nostalgia sites, as well as Tops Drive In and WEAM Radio. So there's a lot of nostalgia in this book, but I, I tried to organize it systematically. So I start with the American Indian presence. And I go through the uh, 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 18th century vestiges, uh, like the, the George Minor house that was built in the 1760s. It just torn down about four years ago up there on Minor Hill. And then I deal with the Civil War and the 22 forts that were here. And uh, I, I, this is the first time this has been published. This is the Highview Hotel atop Chain Bridge in 1909. Uh, I was proud of that. It took some getting to do that. And I have Custis himself shows up in this book a lot, too, if you look at the index. Arlington Spring, that was where he entertained. Uh, it was a pavilion, and they had a lot of uh, uh, dinner and dancing parties there. And uh, the Georgetown University College uh, students would come over and, and have parties there. And uh, uh, that's a painting of it. And then... Uh, I talk about the Alexandria Canal, which Custis had a role into, and it was from the 1830s to the 1880s. And there's a, a lock as recreated in Old Town Alexandria, you can see it. And Jackson City, I talk about Custis spoke at the inauguration of Jackson City. That's right where the 14th Street Bridge is now. And Andrew Jackson was brought in. It was, boy, it was a precursor of uh, the previous president in our, our time here about commercial interests while you're in the White House that a bunch of New York uh, real estate investors sp spotted the growth of Washington, D.C., and they wanted to build a, 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 a luxury village on the Potomac uh, with uh, restaurants and hotels, and uh, they called it uh, after Jackson, Jackson City, and he laid the cornerstone. He was just willing to lend his name to it, but it kind of flopped. It didn't really catch on, and it, by the 1880s and 90s, it was a den of iniquity. Uh, and there's been a lot written about that, but it's a different subject. Uh, and then I talk about some of the uh, um, the radio towers, the, the Three Sisters uh, radio towers that existed uh, right there off of South Courthouse Road. There's a, still a sign for them today. It, they were moved in the 1940s during World War II. 
Uh, and then there's a famous story of Lion, uh, Luna Park, which I think a lot of people know about, has been, been written up. I tried to give it the, a comprehensive write-up. It was an amusement park right at, not, not far from here, at uh, South Glebe Road and uh, Route 1, and where the uh, uh, waste treatment plant is. And uh, it was, uh, had a lot of rides and roller coaster and uh, a big slide, and they had a, four live elephants there, and they escaped in 1906, and they went all out into Northern Virginia and trampled farmland and scared the bejesus out of people. Uh, yeah. And then I have a lot of the old schools that, that are long gone. You know, I, James and Rose School, Nellie Custis School, Carn, Woodmont. Um, yes, there's a whole chapter on Freeman's Village, too. So anyway, that's a, so this is a, if you, have, if you know nothing about Arlington history, this is a, 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 a good way to catch up on it too, because I tried to make it self-contained that way, the introduction. So. And that can be ordered. Yeah, well, it's, it's a, you can get it uh, in a lot of stores in Barnes and Noble and Ayers and uh, CVS, but it's also on Amazon online. And One More Page Books, I like to help them out there over there in East Falls Church. They have both my cusses in this book. So, pardon me? Well, <laughs> I just brought display copies, yeah. At the... Any other questions? Anybody from home? Okay. Well, we're at uh, almost at 2.30. Uh, I've enjoyed this very much, and I enjoy coming over to Crystal City, too, which broadens my horizon. So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>